Have you ever encountered a hurdle with launching or growing your business? Listen, there are two things that run a business, the back end and your soft skills. I'm telling you right now, if these aren't in place, you'll lose clients and you'll lose money. You don't want that? Well, you're in the right place. Hey, I'm Dana. Hey, I'm Sarah. We're your hosts of the Entrepreneur Encounter, and we're going to give you a behind the scenes glance into our businesses, give you genuine feedback, tips and tricks, plus occasionally bring on guests that care about supporting you to grow your business organically and nurturing authentic relationships. Are you ready? You know how everyone says build trust with those you want to work with? Well, it's true because this is about persuading those people into making smart decisions. I mean, you establish credibility. It's a big circle. In order to do one thing, you must do the first thing. It's the steps to get someone to make a decision. Last week, we talked about decision making. So go back and listen to that. And as we go on with our theme, today's discussion is going to be on persuasion. Welcome back to another episode of Entrepreneur Encounter. Where are your hosts, Sarah and Dana? Today we have a special guest. Her name is Jackie. And let me tell you, she's going places. She's a multi-passionate businesswoman. She has the natural ability to persuade, but not in a condescending way, and has an in-depth knowledge, experience, and natural presence that offers clients a multi-level solution. We can go on and on about her, but here she is. Well, hello. Welcome to the show, Jackie. We're excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I just like, this is amazing. So tell us a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I'm a lot, as some people say. And I am a former opera singer. I grew up in a rock and roll household. I am a serial entrepreneur. So I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was 12. And how that started was, is that my father had started teaching lessons out of our house. And the town was like, oh, you can't do that. And he's like, well, why, why I can't do that? He's like, well, you're selling stuff. He's like, no, I'm not. He's like, it's strings, like strings for the guitars. If they break, like I'm not selling anything. So we, we were forced to get a really small corner music store. It was like a triangle, literally, on the corner. And it was so small. I think it was like $300 a month or whatever. And my dad, we got this little small store because that's where he had to start teaching and even like sell strings and like books for the lesson. It was crazy. So that was really the beginning of where I learned business was next to my dad, who had some college education. And my mom really didn't finish even high school. So she wasn't really equipped to kind of do it with him. So I spent my every day after school for free watching the register. (laughs) So that's how it kind of started for me, you know, getting into business, learning business. So I did that for 10 years. And I actually also started my own contracting business when I was 16, giving lessons. So I was giving lessons at the store and piano and voice because I was professionally studying to being an opera singer at 12 too. And it kind of all happened at the same time. And I did that, like I said, for 10 years through college. And basically was asked to debut at La Scala. I studied in Tuscany, Italy, and I wind up meeting so, uh, a prima donna mezzo from La Scala. And she actually asked me to stay. But I kind of came home because I had to finish college. I had like one semester left. And I was like a breadwinner in my home, like in my family. So I just felt obligated to come back there and finish and then maybe go back. Well, you know, life always happens. You just should have probably stayed. But since then, I started and created at least five businesses. So with my dad and then my ex-husband, and he had a graphic design business. And then the last three businesses were really in my name. I never had a business in my name till like a few years ago. And I was actually given the opportunity to have my own agency, which takes 50,000 liquid to have. Like you need to use that 50,000 liquid. So I was like, oh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> so I was like, I'm never going to have an agency. And I'm over here making everybody else's agency and insurance number one, you know, in my first 30 days and like number one. And um, I wind up having a connection like before the COVID, the fall before with Mass Mutual Philadelphia. And the highest guy, and he was like the whole running of whole thing for the last 40 years or something. He branched off and he made a whole division of insurance. 
you know, to have the property casualty insurance brokerage. So he did that with another agent and Mass Mutual. And then I somehow come in just at the right time. And they're like, oh, we want you. And that's how I got my own first business. So then I relocated here to get into real estate and insurance here. And I have two businesses here in Florida, Elevate Stellar Reality, which is a property management company for vacation rentals. And then I have my insurance agency, which went live like six months ago. There's a lot of goof off. So it took a while to kind of make it all happen. <laughs> that's really cool. Cause like when you're a kid and you see the way that your family is, it almost seems people follow their family's footsteps, not all the time. But if you are given that opportunity and that experience and it's good, obviously your kids, like for me, my kids see me pursuing my dream and they're curious, but they're young. So they don't really understand. But I think if right. you're thrown into that situation, I think that gives you more of an idea of like what you want to be when you grow up, so to speak. <laughs> it definitely sparks creativity. Yeah. And it was like opportunity, you know, even though we really didn't have any money growing up. I know I said I have a recording studio in my house. I know that sounds like so luxurious and like, wow, you must have been rich. No, like my dad put a whole recording studio together with like, I wanted to say scissors and tape and call it a day. Like he would like find stuff. Like we had like a real surreal eight trend. And at the time that was, I think the big thing, but it was like used or something. I don't know. Like he found stuff and then he basically like made shift to the studio. And then over time, it kind of went into like a full digital recording studio. We're talking about like, we had like speakers everywhere. It looked like really amazing. And growing up, we had people coming in and out, not just random people, but in the band. And they are like coming, collaborating, you know, they're bringing their talents, creating a group, writing songs, doing gigs, whatever position, what their passion was. I mean, at the time, they weren't really making any money, of course, because you're kind of older and they're just sort of like doing bars and whatever. But, you know, they're, they're holding on to their to their young dreams. You know what I mean? Because my dad actually grew up with a few people who actually made it in the music industry. Like they had at least one hit wonders. So he kind of was already like he knew people he wanted to, you know, he just didn't have that the same opportunity. So kind of in a way just created different opportunities, I guess, along the way. But I've always just had an abundance of opportunities to do things that normal people just don't do. Well, that's awesome. So before we started recording, you said that you were hired to be a problem solver for somebody. Now, do you think that what you experienced as a kid helped you become a problem solver in what you're doing now? I was definitely a problem solver, like playing with it as a child. I remember I was an only child for like almost six years of my life. All of a sudden, my mom's having another baby. I was so happy. I was like, I'm getting a sister. Okay. So I was like crying. I was like so happy. And it's like, I could see it in my head like yesterday. And, you know, there was like being parents when you have, we had three girls and we were all kind of young. You know, it was like, let's say it was six. And then because by the time Deidre came, so it was like six, two and one. But like, they were like, or like an infant, let's say an infant. And because they were like 15, 16 months apart or something or whatever, it was kind of close. So as young parents, you know, you're married, right? You sometimes struggle to, you know, it's not perfect. You know what I mean? Like you're going to get on each other's nerves or things are going to happen and they're like arguing and stuff. So I used to kind of shield my sisters from that, actually. So anytime they got into an argument, I kind of like took them in my room and we would like turn up the music on my sonograph record player and we would play with dolls and Barbies and, you know, stuff like that. Like just pretend we're in our own little world because I was like, I didn't want to hear it and I didn't want them to hear it either. So I think that was like my first problem solving move. Yeah, for sure. I think we all problem solve at some point when we're kids. We don't even realize it, but we do. Right. To me, it's a natural skill, but obviously as time goes on, then you start to learn it more and figure out different ways to problem solve. I think you're right. We all have an element of capability of being a problem solver, but I think that there are just some people who are just really great at it or just or over time they develop that skill like even more and more and more. And they're just, you know, it's so apparent because, you know, a lot of times people neglect their skills. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So if it's in everybody, which I guess it could be, right? But You just don't craft it. You don't hone it. I didn't even know I was a problem solver, to be honest. 
So I took a break from the insurance industry because agents are snakes and you're being told one thing and given another thing and I can never find the right person to work with and hence not a mentor. So I got out of the industry. I was so like just distraught by it. I was just like, I need to write. So I went in a completely different direction. I just was like, I got to get a job doing something. And I wound up working two full-time jobs remotely for an insurance agent. And then I did some temp work for like a warehouse. Turned out to be Walmart warehouse. And then when I left that agent, because I was like, this is not what we discussed was going to happen here, whatever, with he gave me tasks to do. And I did them in like 2.5 seconds, which it would take other people like a month. Mm. I don't just didn't understand. So I was like, this is not working out. So anyway, so then I wound up getting hired directly from Walmart and I applied, I guess I applied to a problem solver job. I don't even know if I applied to that job, but I applied for a job and in the warehouse, they're like, we're just going to buy. And I was like, because I wasn't a front, yeah, because I was just packing, you know, it was like Christmas time. I was just packing, getting orders out, packing them up, you know, whatever. Then I wound up, like I said, up being hired with them because I was just like, well, I just need something. So, and that's how I got into it. So I met this man, I think his name was Ian or something. It was strange. Anyway, he's like a foreign guy too, working at Walmart. He had some kind of accent from somewhere. And he was just like, I go in there, I have this interview. I don't know. He really liked me. He wowed me. I don't really know why he liked me so much because it was probably a really low time in my life. Like I was trying to get my life back on track. I left my ex-husband. Like I was battered, broken and bruised. You know what I'm saying? Like I was just in a really weird, bad place. And I was trying to fix my credit, work two jobs, fix so much stuff that he messed up. And I was like, just hustling. I was just hustling. Like trying to do all this. And I don't really recall like there that I've had, like I was too confident, like in myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I've always been a very confident person, but at that point, I would probably say I was kind of like at a lower point in my life. So I don't know if he saw something, it was like magic or something. And he's like, I want you. And I'm like, why me for what? I mean, it's like, <laughs> he's like, I want to put you on my team. I'm like, on your team for what? And he's like, I want to make you a problem solver. And I want to make you the lead problem solver on the night shift. And I was like, okay. I was like, I don't know what number this means. He's like, it's okay. He's like, you're going to come to day shift. You're going to be with us like for several weeks or whatever. And I'm going to have you trained with my lead problem solver on day shift. So I was like, okay, there's this dude. Really, he was super nice, really tall guy. Like walking into the, into like all the mechanics and stuff. It was just weird, but I learned and then I brought it to that shift and I did it for like eight, 10 months. But the warehouse was like 80% Spanish. So I'm speaking Italian Spanish to them. It was like, they loved it. It was wild. But that was a really an interesting time that I look back to now. And that's where I learned that I am a problem solver. That's awesome. And from there, like, it's just boom, boom, boom. Like I just kind of, I started applying it in my insurance life and educating people. And then, cause I went back into insurance in a different way. Even now, like, I feel like I'm constantly solving people's problems. Like, not just my own. Not that, like, I try not to have any problems, so we eliminate all that together, but I stay away from that. But I'm constantly solving someone's problem. Like, someone comes along and they're like, oh, I need this, or I need help with this, or I don't know what I'm doing. And I'd be like, boom, 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 here you go. Yeah, I think that's why we go into business. I know both Data and I, you know, obviously we do business management, but we do different things. But obviously, like, we have to solve people's problems. Well, I think it's definitely in what you guys do yeah. in the business development management world. I learned knowledge, wisdom in how to navigate problem solving. And I mean, like, because things are always going to arise. Like, so if you're like, you're helping an owner manage a team, well, you know, there's going to be problems on a daily basis. Even if it's not a problem in the team, it's like a client's having a problem and then the team's trying to help the client figure it out. Like stuff, right? Because there's always... I don't know about you, but I feel like stuff always is on the rise every day. You go into the day, you're okay, great. All of a sudden, you got to put out fires, put that out. You're putting fires out everywhere. It's like, oh my God, can I just get a calm day? For <laughs> With that thought process and you having so much experience, like overcoming hurdles, can you provide tips or suggestions to our listeners on how to expand their ability to provide solutions to their clients or to their team members? You got to think out the box, like a lot. 
It's not always the direct answer. You have to be strategic. You have to be logical. You have to just be willing to be creative and figure stuff out. It's not always like black and white. There's just so many other elements that are coming up, that's popping up. And you're like, well, I can't do it that way. It's like like financing, right? Okay, I need financing. Well, I don't have the right track record or the credit. Well, okay, there's creative financing and, you know, seller's financing. Like there's other things that you can do to not use your own money, especially if you don't have any money, right? <laughs> to be an investor. So it's like, you got to really just think outside the box a lot. I mean, as entrepreneurs, that's all we do all day, every day. We're business owners, we have a team. And even if Sarah's on my team, I hired her to basically help me delegate the team and whatever. I need to lead with that. I got to lead to be like, okay, not everything's cut and dry and everything's black and white. So we have to lead outside the box. Like, okay, we have a problem. What's the problem? The problem is, is we're trying to, we need more clients. Okay. How can we get more clients? You know, okay. What about distributing flyers? And then where could we go? And this all kinds of stuff, right? Just as this one idea, whatever. But that you got to think outside the box and like what are you willing to do and not willing to do because you need to have boundaries. But you got to be willing to assist the client as much as you can as possible. Oh. And a lot of times it's educating and researching. Research is key. You got to research things because, and it's okay, you don't know everything. I mean, I know a lot, but sometimes things get swirled at me like, oh, I got to be my own divorce lawyer. I got to learn how to be a divorce lawyer. You know what I mean? Like, you just got to go for it. You know, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you just have to, like, just jump in and just be open, willing, and flexible to do that, to just figure it out, whether that's with research, your logical mind, your common sense, just so many things, and just really encourage your team to be creative. Encourage them to give suggestions. Don't teach them that you have to have all the ideas, like the suggestions. Do you have suggestions? Do you have any ideas? What do you think we should do? I mean, like, it doesn't have to be all on me all the time. You know, Sarah, come up with an idea for this or just think about this. You know, how can we make the team better with this or whatever? And then let's say you're my management team and this is what you do anyway. You should probably come up with it pretty quickly, but then we can move forward with that. It's just really encouraging people to operate and move freely and learn their own skills, right? And then how they can be better for the whole team. So outside of the box thinking, I feel like should be at the top of the list. Yes. Like being creative and resourceful and problem solving, because even though like two problems may sound on paper or read on paper similar, the people aren't the same. The circumstances aren't going to be exactly the same. So the solution isn't going to be cookie cutter. Right. So sometimes you do have to do that. Think outside the box. Yeah. No, I think a lot of times you just really do. You know, you have to be adaptable. This world is always changing. It's ever changing. Who would have thought like 20 years ago that we'd be speaking into the phone in Surrey and Amazon, Alexa, whoever, right? We're like, oh, I need this. I, I just actually asked Alexa last night. I said, Alexa, I don't want her to do anything. I'm like, Alexa, how long should I cook than spaghetti because I mean, I already know this, but I wanted to hear it first. Tell me, you know, exactly like what's the minimum? She's like eight to 12 minutes. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to just sit on a timer for eight because sometimes I forget and I'm walking away. <laughs> I'm like, duh, duh, duh. okay, but everything's so convenient now that we wasn't ever before. You know, research is definitely easier to obtain to figure out even small stuff or big stuff. And chat GPT is like changing the world too. But there's just so many things that's just so out there accessible to us. And then being adaptable, because I don't know about you guys, but don't you always feel like something like new, <laughs> this is coming out that's going to change the whole game. Like this chat GPT thing. I'm just saying this right now because I wasn't really using it. I didn't even really know it existed till a month or two ago. So <laughs> I've used it now to like help me make uh, my eBooks and my elevator pitch and like tell me some pretty amazing things about myself. I was like, out of what I said it. So I was like, okay, I do this, this, this. It was pretty interesting, amazing. So you just gotta be adaptable. The world's changing. People are changing. They're not everybody. You can say something to someone and they're not gonna take it right. I just said that kind of like happened. You know, not gonna take it or that kind of be able to communicate properly with you. You're not going to be able to communicate properly with them. Then sometimes they're just not for you, but you just have to like 
be willing and open to like figure it out. So I know when I hire, I kind of give them a few weeks probationary period. And I'd say, let's see if this works out because we got to see, do we have the right energy? And then is it the right fit? Like, are you able to communicate and do what I'm requiring you to do if I'm not there when you're going solo? You know, I really do feel like it's just being adaptable and not everybody is for everyone. You know, not every people, place and thing is for me and that's okay, but you got to be adaptable. And then you figure it out like clients too. Not every client's for you. Sometimes you got to say bye-bye because it's just, you're stressing me out. You asked me to do a job, I'm doing it. And then you're like, why are you like, not questioning, but why are you like, why is there an issue? You know what I mean? Like I've done what you asked me to do, whatever. But I just think it's like I said, in general, it's just being open, being teachable, being flexible, being even vulnerable with your team so that you can let them know. Like, like I tell, I know a lot and there's a lot that I don't know, but there are some things I don't know, you know, (laughs) but it's, you know, maybe less than other people. So I know we were talking about persuasion at the beginning. Now there's like a negative thought to persuading somebody. It's like, You're not trying to tell somebody what to do, but when you're making a decision, you get all the facts together to persuade your answer. So like when we're talking about different perspectives, talking about adapting, talking about the communication, I think like persuading goes all, it's a big circle, right? Because you're trying to get to a solution and I'm not going to say like it has to be this way, but let's have a conversation about it. So you persuade somebody to get to the decision, but in a way that it's not telling somebody what to do. So I think it's like persuasion and decision-making kind of go hand in hand. Also compromise, just like in any relationship, right? There's compromise too. I mean, when I present a solution to someone, sometimes I actually have more than one solution. More than once, I'll have like one to three solutions. Like if it's Something terrible, like I only have one solution. <laughs> but most of the time I try to come to them with like a couple of options, like two, three options or whatever. You just need to know the whole story, kind of like what's the background and then what's their need? What's their pain point? And then really try to tailor what the solution is for them. And like I said, there may not just be one solution. It could be two or three, could be 10. We don't even know, but it's then bringing that to them. And I always say to like my financial clients, You know, because I'm giving them, you said multi-level solution, right? Okay, we're giving them multiple options of investing. Okay, all right, we can invest in insurance. We can invest in real estate. We can invest in annuities. We can, you know, in the market, out the market. I got to find out like, Sarah, do you like the market? Do you, are you afraid of losing money? Some people are very terrified of that. So you're like, that's not an option. So we're not even going to talk about it. You know what I mean? So it's finding, you know, learning about your client, tailoring it to their needs, What is it that they need and want? And then putting all that together. And then for me, like with my real estate clients, I'm always trying to figure out ways that we can save on our investments because you got to spend money to make money. So sometimes you can cut back on other things or like, okay, I can buy this here versus here because it's going to save hundreds of dollars. And it's good for your client, even though it might have like taken a little of an extra step or detour. But it's helped, it's helped them. You know, it's not really a big deal. So it's just being able to listen and be intuitive and hear what they're really saying so that you can, like, you can't ever think about the same. You got to think about what they need. So it's like, even as a business owner, and Sarah's going to work with me, right, to help me and my company, my team. And I tell her, well, this is what I'm struggling with. I'm able to communicate that directly to you, but not everybody's able to. Then you got to kind of like, okay, control the conversation, meaning like being able to ask the right questions to get to the right answers so that you can help them. But it's just about getting to know them. I don't even know half the time what I make on commission when I'm doing insurance because I just don't care because I'm trying to help the client. So a lot of times I'm doing pro bono work. I'm helping somebody who really can't afford my service, but they need my help with their retirement application because they don't know what they're doing. They're like persuasion, decision-making, problem-solving, communication, and all that intertwines. When you're working with your clients, that's the only way that you're going to be able to work with them is if you have these skills. Because if you don't have problem-solving skills, communication skills, all these other soft skills, then essentially you're not going to be able to do your job. Right. No, no, I think so. That's why I said to you, I don't know if I said this on the recording, but 
when you're hiring people for your team, like they got to have a few evidential soft skills, like two or three, because you can always teach them. Not saying everybody's going to be good at every single one, but you can always teach them, teach skills and still, you know, new knowledge, right? Then now you've helped them to grow. You've made them more valuable for themselves and for you. And now you can elevate them to the next level to where they're meant to go in your company, for you, in life, you know, whatever. So I guess the last thing would be, where can we find you? Because you are all over the place. So where's the best way to connect with you? Yeah, I am all over the place. Well, the easiest thing, to be honest, if you really want basic, type me in Google, Jackie Casella. Like I'm everywhere. So you'll see like Facebook. And Facebook comes up a lot for so. Facebook is so easy. So, I mean, you can definitely find me on Facebook. So if you, and you got to remember my name, Jackie Casella. And then B, you got to know my businesses because you can just easily just say my name, say my businesses, Elevate Stellar Reality, Casella Insurance Solutions. And you're getting all of my information, my websites, my Facebook, my Instagram. We have a Twitter and a TikTok, even though we're, I don't know about the Twitter account. Oh, and LinkedIn in like that threads. I don't know about that stuff either, but you know, I'm really predominant on LinkedIn. So that's easy. And then, you know, obviously Facebook is number one, to be honest, yeah. this unless you're going to write down my number. All her information is going to be in the show notes. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thank you. Thank you everybody for tuning in. As always, the information is in our show notes. Until next time. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Remember, soft skills aren't just some fluffy buzzwords that get thrown around in the corporate world. They're the key to unlocking your full potential as a professional and a human being. Don't be afraid to invest in yourself and seek out opportunities to improve your soft skills. Sarah and I have a variety of workshops, online courses, and complimentary clarity calls for you to practice in real time with us. Links are always in the show notes. And be sure to join us next time for more insights, tips, and tricks to help you succeed in your entrepreneur encounter.